In the last video, I mentioned reference conversions versus time conversions versus casting. I want to get a little more clear in this video. First of all, casting, I think, is a bad word. I mentioned this again, but casting, I think, back to my high school days when I was in the metal shop, and I would make this mold, and I'd throw all this steel in it, really hot steel, and out would pop something I totally did not intend to pop out. But that's the idea. I'm casting something. I'm changing something. I'm taking steel or metal, and I'm changing it to something else. And when we say casting and programming... I think the word casting has that same connotation when, yeah, sometimes we're casting steel or metal into some other kind of, we're, we're changing the bits and the bytes, but that, that's called a conversion, all right? A cast can sometimes cause a conversion, meaning we're, we're changing that steel into something else. But a cast, most of our casts don't really change anything at all. In fact, most of the time we're just telling the compiler, hey, look at this data a little differently, but it doesn't mean at runtime, the runtime goes and muddles with the bits and changes it to something else and something different. Allow me to try to illustrate. I have base and derived. Well, somewhat from our last example, I came down here and said derived D gets new derived. Let me draw our stack and our heap again. So this is the stack, and this is the heap, and then D goes down right here. It's a little reference, references the object we create with new there. And derived, let's look at derived again. Derived inherits base, and it has a float, and it has an int. So it's going to be 64 bits wide. Let's just say that's 64 bits. And the int portion is right here, and the float portion is right here. All right, now, when I come down here, and I showed this in the last video, I say base B gets D. Well. A reference conversion happens here. All right, we're we're looking at D or what D is referencing. We're going to look at it through a base eyes, the compile time type. This is all the compiler knows about B is that it's a base, even though it's really referencing a derived. All right, again, the compiler cannot see the new derived. As far as the compiler is concerned, it is gone, vaporized. All right, but we know it's there, so let me bring it back. But that's the idea. This is the runtime type right there. This is the runtime type. This is the compile time type, and the compiler will only uh, work with the, what it knows about the reference. The it'll only work with what it knows about the compile time type. So this is performing a reference conversion. D is really a derived reference, but then in between here and here, the compiler has to essentially convert this reference to that reference. Well, what does that mean? What physically happens inside of your computer? What bits change? Well, I'll tell you, nothing changes. It's it's still an address. D is a address to this. Let me let's actually give it an address. Let's say it's at eight five two Wing Street. I don't know. Sound good. Wing Street. All right, it's actually a memory address, a number, but but maybe that address helps you out. So it's 852, that's a 2, and then this is Wing Street. Okay, when I make B, B is just another reference, and all I'm doing with B is copying the value here up to here. All right, 852 Wing Street. But no, no conversion happened there, no hocus but we didn't change any of the bits all right it's just a, merely a copy and so this is purely a compile time thing the compiler just looks at it and says oh you want me to view it as a base instead of a drive totally chill i'm cool with it now i did a example a little later where i said d gets b and now i'm saying hey d needs to look at what b is referencing and the compiler complains and says hey uh there's a good chance that b could be referencing a base instance or it could be referencing something else that inherits from base so th there's a chance this could fail this is a chance this could fail now we know it's referencing a derived in this case so now i come here and i do what we call a cast all right the explicit cast i showed in the last video but let me ask you a question are we really casting anything? Is, and what by I mean casting, I mean what I did in high school. Are we changing any of the bits? Are we taking any steel and changing that? No. All right, we're just saying, hey, you know what? B has an address in it. It's actually the same address D already has, but just look at it differently, compiler. There you go. So that th that's really what a reference conversion is. It's it's not like we're really converting anything. We're just looking at it differently. I wanna, I'm want i getting kind of really technical here, but I want to be technical. I think a true computer scientist is aware of all these nuances and instead of just saying, oh, it's a reference and I'm doing this cast. And the cast means it's doing something. It's not doing anything. It's, it's simply looking at it differently. Now let me show you a cast which does do 
does do, that sounds terrible, which performs a type conversion, keyword conversion, meaning something at runtime has to do some work. It muddles around with the bits. I'm going to take that off. I'm going to say int i gets 5, float f gets i. No cast present. I can control shift b this. Notice the build succeeds. However, an int is stored much differently in RAM than a float is. All right, a 5 in int land is represented much differently than in a float. And if you really want to understand the intricacies of a float, I have several excellent videos on the topic on uh, floating point types and how the bits represent floating point types and all that sort of thing. But let me tell you that yes, work has to be performed at runtime to convert this int to a float. When your program is executing, the CPU must stop and do some extra work to make the bits inside of this int represent the exact same value the way that a float would do it. So in this case, I almost consider that more casting than putting something in parentheses before my value. Like we can be explicit here and, and say, hey, yes, please cast. I need you to do some work. Convert the bits inside this int to what represents a float. Anyway, you can go watch the floating point videos there if you like. Now, I don't need to be explicit about this cast, like I'm being right here, because a float is capable of representing every single value that an int can represent, and a float can do it perfectly. Thus, the compiler knows no information could possibly be lost with this type of conversion. All right, unfortunately, we call this a conversion. Well, it is a conversion, so I guess that is fortunate. But when we say cast, it's almost like... <sighs> You're doing work? No, we're not doing work. Somet sometimes we're doing work. In this case, yeah, we're doing work. If I wanted to turn around and say I gets F, well, now the compiler's going to complain and say, hey, uh, float can represent a whole lot more than what an int can, and there's a good chance you're going to lose some data, and I can do this work if you want me to. I can, ha I can omit the code to make the runtime do this work for you at runtime. It'll take a little bit of costing, but we're going to have to do some work and convert some bits and that sort of thing. So if you want to do that, sure, go for it, but you must do it explicitly. So now here we're kind of casting into the mold. So anyway, maybe I'm not making sense, maybe I am, but casting is basically saying, hey, I got some data, look at it differently. And sometimes a cast could cause a type conversion, as as in this case. All right? But here we don't have a cast, and yet we're still performing a type conversion. Let me control shift B and prove to you that this builds and the squiggly is gone. Now, you can terminate the video at this point if you like to. But if you want to see how this really works down low, not on the missile CLR level, but down with the x86 is the was the architecture I'm compiling for. If you want to see how that works, I'm going to show you. <laughs> so come along for the ride. If you don't understand it, that's fine. Stop the video or just watch. And I watch several sci-fi movies without understanding what's going on, but I still enjoy them. And However, this isn't sci-fi. This is actually how it really works. So yeah, yeah. if you want to learn this stuff uh, low level, go watch the assembly programming playlist. I'm going to hit F11 here. I have two windows that come up. I have the disassembly, which is the low-level x86 hardcore past the missile level of code. In fact, let me just show that. We write C-sharp, we compile it, the C-sharp compiler turns it into missile, which is platform independent and can theoretically run on any CPU. But we are actually running on my CPU under the 32-bit architecture. I, uh, that's just how it works out. I'm, and that needs to be further compiled by the jitter. If you heard of the jitter, I talk about that in other videos, but J-I-T-T-E-R. It's just-in-time compiler, which converts these high-level missile instructions down to native code. All right, and the native code is what actually executes. And that's what we're seeing here is native code. All right, and then we're also seeing the actual memory how it looks. In fact, memory is kind of interesting here. What's the Seastead and secure location in Tranet? You should a add the web page that I wonder something took over. Something possessed this RAM before we took it over, and and that's what's there. I'd be kind of curious to scroll up and down and read the whole message here. And that's how kind of viruses and hackers get in. They if, if they can get in and see the RAM. Anyway, I'm, I'm going off. But essentially, we've. We, there's some RAM here. It is part of our process space, and we got just got it. It's kind of like when you buy a used car. If there's stuff left over in the car, that's how you get it. No warranties with a used car. All right. Uh, you can see here 
this uh, I into I. So we see our C sharp code, and then we see the corresponding native code. Basically, this is the C sharp we wrote, and this is how it was translated down into native code. All right, and we, here's some C sharp code. You can see here I'm assigning I to a float, and there's more instructions here. Assigning the value 5 to I took just one native instruction, whereas converting an I to a float or an int to a float uh, took up more than just one instruction. Anyway, and then we see where we convert our float back to an int. Uh, right now we're at here. I want to go look in this memory window. The reason I have this memory window up is I want to go look at the address of I, what's actually out in RAM. And I, the name I translates to the cryptic but reliable memory address as an actual memory address. It's nice to be able to think in terms of I instead of these low-level guts. But anyway, yada, yada, yada. We're saying here, I'm scrolling around. Let me drag this out just a little bit. Right here we're saying move the value 5 into that memory location. Right? And this memory location is our stack. Right? It's this piece of memory sectioned off to be our stack. Now I'm going to do some hocus pocus with the video recording software pause, but I want to pull up this location in the memory window over here. So excuse me, excuse me for a sec. Okay, we're becoming really cramped, but you can see I highlighted these four bytes, which represent our integer. I'm going to hold down Control and scroll my mouse wheel back a little bit. Turn the video quality up to high definition so you can see this. I'm sorry I have to go so small here, but I'm limited and I can't really change the font size in here. At least I haven't investigated how. I can hold down Control and scroll, but it doesn't do anything. Okay, int i gets 5. This is i right here. I'll go as far as circling these four bytes and saying that is i. I'll click over here, and I'm just going to debug in C-sharp here, but the corresponding code will execute over here in native land. So F10, move the value 5 into that memory location. So expect to see a 5 here. There we go. Our 5 shows up here at the lowest address. That has to do with uh, go Google little, little Indian, Big Indian, or watch my assembly programming playlist if you really under want to understand why the 5's here instead of over here. doesn't really matter. There's our 5. Uh, float f gets i. Well, I'll tell you where f's hanging out. f is the next 32 bits on the stack. Right? I've drawn that several times. So this is f. These four bytes represent f. Okay, and you can see that to convert or to put a 5 into i, that was one native instruction. But to convert i to a float takes up four native instructions and I'm not going to go into all the details here you can google those if you want but I can say hey uh, float integer fi float integer load which does a copy but it also has to do that conversion thing that casting not the casting conversion thing there's no cast in my code right here or at least at this line there's no cast that's I can't believe I messed it up it has to do the conversion, the type conversion, the bits have to be different. So watch what happens. I'm going to F10 over here, which will force this yellow debug line to go down to here and execute all four of these lines of code rapidly. So watch what happens. F10, there we go, we're down here. And oh, hey, look. Hey, look, what do you see here? All right, this changed too, but here's our F, and it doesn't look anything like our int, and yet they're both storing the same value. Okay, the CPU had to literally look at the bits inside these four bytes and say, oh, I need to convert that so it represents correctly in floating point way. Anyway, go watch my floating point videos if you really want to understand what these bits mean and the mantissa and the exponent and that sort of thing. It's, it's pretty interesting, actually. It's very cool. Let's, uh, let's try going the other way. Now, we're not going to see any magic happen here, but I want to convert these bits back to the value 5, and it turns out we're already 5, so... Nothing will really change. But I'm going to hit F10, and that performs work as well. But it required a cast to force the compiler to say, hey, do it. All right, X, emit the instructions to do it. Yeah, we may use some data, or lose some data. We may lose some data. If I have 3.1415927 and I cast that to an int, I'll only have a 3. Sure enough, I may lose some data, but that's fine. I'll deal with it. All right, anyway, I'm babbling on. The, there's the difference between a cast and a type conversion. Sometimes casts cause type conversions, but most of the time they don't. They just, hey, copy the reference and look at it differently. So, anyway, whew.